Uh, okay, so the, today I'm going to talk about some work I did uh, last year with Ahmed, uh, Juan, George Santos, and Ying Zhao. And, um, and I, I would also like to thank them for teaching me a lot about the subject. And I should mention that there's a lot of earlier and subsequent work, especially two papers last May, one a single author paper by Jeff Pennington, and another by Almheri, Maxfield, Maralf, and Engelhardt and also some papers by the group at Stanford and Cornell. And there are also many others uh, which I haven't had time to mention today. I will not try to cover the whole swath of results that, uh, that, have, that we have learned over the last year and all their implications. For that, you can watch talks by many of the preceding authors uh, from the IAS workshop last December or the KITP quantum gravity program this year and the associated conference. Okay, basically this talk will be about quantum extremal surfaces, a notion that was introduced by Engelhardt and Wall. And what the quantum extremal surface tries to answer is the question about computing entanglement entropy in gauge gravity duality. And just by way of one line motivation, the whole motivation of the work uh, from the past year is to derive the page curve of an evaporating black hole. So of course that has to do with entropy and the gauge gravity duality is a theory of gravity we understand. So we would like to understand entanglement entropy and gauge gravity duality. Okay, so here we have ADS uh, D plus one. Usually my ADS will always be uh, D plus one dimensional. The boundary is D dimensional and B shown in red is a subregion of the quantum mechanical theory. And what we are instructed to do is to consider all possible co-dimension two surfaces in the gravity region, capital A, which is also shown in the figure, and extremize some kind of quantity that depends on capital A. What that quantity is, Engelhardt and Wall say, should be the area of the surface capital A divided by the Newton's constant plus S bulk. S bulk is the entropy of the bulk matter in the hatched region shown in the figure. Okay, so this is a function L of, that depends on a co-dimension two surface. And the claim of Engelhardt and Wall that generalizes the HRRT and the FLM formulas is that the entanglement entropy of the region B is the minimum over all such A of this generalized entropy function L. The minimizing surface is said to be the quantum extremal surface and I will denote it by A star. And this is just one part of the statement of quantum extremal surface. The second part, which is equally important, is that it, the quantum extremal surface encodes some kind of subregion subregion duality. So we know that the entire CFT is dual to the entire bulk, but the gravity uh, has a subregion that's dual to the CFT subregion B. And the claim is that that bulk region is the region between A star and B. So if you consider this hatched surface, and if A was A star, then that bulk region would be the subregion in the bulk dual to capital B. Okay, I would like to make two remarks about this uh, functional S gen. The first thing is that it's a claim that it's functional as UV finite, even though S bulk, the entanglement entropy has UV divergences. And I'm not an expert on this, but this is work going back to Saskain and Ugloom, in which arguments were made that the divergence in uh, S bulk is precisely canceled by the renormalization of the Newton's constant. There are also some arguments from ads -CFT and basically those arguments have to do with the following. So uh, B, the boundary subregion has some UV divergence in the entanglement entropy, but in the bulk that's completely captured by uh, the part of ADS near the boundary. Like ADS is big near its boundary and that big space captures the UV divergences in the field theory. So there should not be any extra UV divergences coming from bulk of capital A. Okay, those are some uh, things and it's, just keep, it's good to keep that at the back of the, our minds. And the second remark 
is that gravitation, the graviton contributions to S bulk are not well understood. So to avoid that, we just take the bulk matter to have large number of degrees of freedom so that their contribution to S bulk overwhelms the graviton contribution and we don't have to worry about the gravitons. Okay, so are there any questions at uh, this point? Okay, if not, then let's move on. And the next thing, of course, is that S bulk is impossible to compute. It's some, we don't even know in higher dimensions how to compute it for simple theories and simple states and simple regions in those theories. So what do we do? There is a first scenario in which the entanglement entropies are computable and that's two dimensional. So if we take your gravity theory to be two dimensional and the bulk matter is also a two dimensional CFT, then we know some formulae for the entanglement entropies. And indeed in the gravitational context, this was already exploited by Fiola, Preskill, Strominger and Trivedi in this paper from 1994, which was in the context of the CGHS model. And of course the paper from May that I mentioned earlier was in this setting. And I will describe scenario two later in the talk. So for now, we are just going to focus on two dimensions and now I'm going to give some examples of non-trivial quantum extremal surfaces from uh, this paper with Kwan and Ahmed from October. Okay, so the setting is going to be ADS-JT gravity. Uh, this theory has two fields, the dilaton phi and the two-dimensional metric G. Uh, there's, a, there's a bulk term, this phi times R plus two, and a boundary term, uh, which is the Gibbons Hawking term. That's it. And all, what I want, um, uh, to say about these parameters is that epsilon and phi r are some parameters that have dimensions of length. Epsilon is some UV cutoff, but phi r will appear in many quantities below because it's a length scale. And uh, we're going to compute some positions of extremal surfaces in the bulk. So we should remember that phi r has dimensions of length and G Newton is of course dimensionless in two dimensions. I should not just tell you what the Lagrangian is, but I should also tell you the boundary conditions, which are just that the boundary metric and the dilaton have some Dirichlet boundary conditions, which are pinned to large values set by the UV cutoff epsilon. Okay, so just two quick comments about two dimensional um, entanglement entropies or quantum extremal surfaces, since a QES is a co-dimension two surface, it's just a point or a set of points. And that leads us to comment number two, what is the area of a point? It's not an area anymore, but it's equal to the value of the scalar field at the point A. It's because if we look at this action, phi sits multiplying one over G Newton. And if theory came from a dimensional reduction of a higher dimensional theory, phi would precisely be the area of the transverse space. So what this means is that our entropy functional instead of having the area term is going to just have a dilaton term. And we will often set 4G Newton to one to simplify formulas. Okay, so here's the probably the simplest solution for phi and G, which is just that the metric is a Poincaré patch in ADS2. Um, it, it's because uh, the equation of motion for phi here sets R to negative two, and that has ADS2 as a solution. And I have taken X to be negative if for reasons that will become clear later. And we also define some light cone coordinates, T plus X and T minus X. And the dilaton is simply proportional to one over negative X. Again, there's a minus sign because X is negative. And there's a boundary at X equals minus epsilon where the boundary conditions for the boundary metric GTT and the dilaton are satisfied. So phi R over epsilon and DT squared over epsilon squared. Anyway, so here's a picture. Here's ADS2, or the white triangle is the Poincaré patch, and there's the green line is the boundary sitting at x equals negative epsilon. And this theory has a dual. The dual is a, just a quantum mechanical system. So it's a bunch of fermions, which I've drawn with these dots here. So these are supposed to be some Majorana fermions of perhaps of the SYK model, and it has a world line time. Okay, and of course, we don't just want to have a gravity theory, we want to have some matter fields chi. So we have the gravitational action plus 
we take our CFT coupled to the background metric and not coupled directly to the dilaton phi. Uh, so chi couples to phi only indirectly through, through G. And uh, the last bit of review that we need is a entanglement entropy formula in CFT2, the Cardi Calabrese formulas. So if we have a space like line segment AB, then the entanglement entropy of AB in the vacuum is C over three times the log of length of AB. Well, it would be log of the length if A and B were on the same time slice, but I have put them here slightly tilted. So we just put a one half here and the L becomes L squared, which generalizes to the invariant interval between A and B. Okay, and now I'm just splitting up the delta X plus and the delta X minus. And the very important thing for this talk is going to be these additional factors of omega A at A and omega at B. So what is capital omega? Because our space is not just flat, it's curved. The metric um, omega is just the vial factor in the line element defined like follows. So ds squared has a minus one over omega squared dx plus dx minus. In particular for ADS2, omega is just going to be equal to x. Um, any questions? How did you get from this line with the uh, delta x plus delta x minus over epsilon squared to the next line? So this formula is supposed to be in a flat space. That's what I meant by the arrow. And this line, the next line, is a formula in curved space. One way to imagine it is that the entanglement entropy is computed by inserting some twist operators at capital A and capital B. And it's some, we have to compute some correlation function of those twist operators. And because of the while transformation between the physical metric and the flat metric in X plus X minus, we pick up factors of the conformal, uh, the, the while factor. So it comes from correlation functions of twist operators in a non-trivial uh, background. We can also think of it in a different way, which is that the cutoff we should impose if we are in curved space should be a cutoff in the physical metric, which is ds squared. And the epsilon is just a coordinate cutoff in the x's. So, so, so that's where the omega comes in. Okay, so now let's compute some entanglement wedge. Uh, well, right now the boundary was just a single spatial point, so we can only compute the entanglement wedge of the entire boundary. And we had better find that the entanglement wedge is the entire point for a patch, otherwise there's just something wrong. Okay, well, one more thing to remember is that since ADS space has a boundary at x equals zero, the CFT in the bulk is on a space with a boundary. And so we will not get independent uh, log x plus and log x minus contributions. There will just be one contribution because of the boundary on the right hand side, this boundary here. Okay, so let's compute the generalized entropy functional. We ha I have here the point B, which is at the origin, and the point A, which is at some x comma minus x. Okay, so these are the plus and minus coordinates. So what is the generalized entropy functional going to be? Well, it's going to have a dilaton term, which is going to be phi r over negative x. We are going to get a term from the coordinate separations. And remember, we are only going to get one term because delta x plus and delta x minus are not independent. And then there is this term from omega, omega at the point A. Okay, but what is that? Omega in ADS2 was just equal to x. So these two terms just cancel. And all you're left with is uh, phi r over negative x. Okay, it's because log of omega was just equal to log of negative x. Okay, so here's our generalized entropy functional. And of course, where is it minimized? it's minimized at x equals negative infinity. Okay, so that makes sense, is that the entanglement wedge of the boundary point, which was just a single point, is all the way uh, over here. 
and the entanglement wedge is the entire Poincaré horizon, is in the entire Poincaré patch. Okay, uh, questions? Yeah, I have one question. Um, yeah. You hear me? Yeah. So, so um, later on, you're going to be again looking at more general uh, backgrounds? Uh, not really for this talk, no. It's always going to be some eternal. Uh, it, I'm not going to be considering evaporating black holes in this talk. If okay, that's what because indeed my question would have been if we compute the entanglement entropy, it depends obviously on the state that we're looking at. Um, yeah, so the and state it, and here. If you're in a, the curved space time, you have to choose what your vacuum state is. Right. So the state here was the t equal to zero ground state of the of the dual theory. Right. So, so that in, was in, the state I was discussing. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So now we are trying to going to couple our quantum mechanical system, which we can think of as a quantum dot, to a wire. And so here's the, here's the quantum dot, and now we have coupled it to a quantum wire. There's no gravity in this picture. And the motivation for the setup comes from trying to make a large ADS black hole evaporate by coupling its boundary to a path reservoir system. Okay, a natural guess for the gravity dual of the system is an ADS2 space over here and a flat space region to the right. Okay, so that's why I had chosen ADS2 to have a negative X coordinate because the positive X coordinate is going to be occupied by this, by this Bach region. And we should always remember that the dual of this is some SYK coupled to a wire. And there's a time direction here, which I, I have dropped for this figure. Okay. Uh, moreover, we take this wire to be built from the same stuff that was propagating on ADS2. That's for simplicity and to have a simple model. And the difference now is that the CFT then is no longer on a space with boundary because those uh, excitations here can move to the flat space and the excitations in the flat space can move to the ADS region we supply transparent boundary conditions. So now the left movers and the right movers are going to be independent. Okay, so let's see if something happened to the entanglement wedge of the origin. Okay, so let's try to write this uh, entanglement entropy formula. Well, there's the dilaton term, which is the same. Remember, we haven't changed the geometry in the bulk, it's just the zero temperature ADS2. Plus, we are going to have now two contributions, one from the right movers and one from the left movers. But there is still just a single log of omega at point A. Okay, so one omega of A is again negative x, so this is still just phi r over negative x plus uh, c over six log of negative x. And this is what I wanted to write here. But a plot of this, I mean, we can all take a derivative. It's a simple thing. One over x squared plus one over x. And this is what this functional looks like. And indeed, now it has a minimum at some non-infinite uh, value of x. If you take a derivative here, you easily see, uh, let me put a prime here. And this is phi r over x squared plus c over six x. So this vanishes when x equals this value, phi r, which was the length scale, remember, and six over c is some dimensionless number. Okay, so it's no longer uh, so negative uh, infinity. Uh, Babu, sorry to interrupt. Yes. But can you say again, where does that factor two comes from in the middle term? Yeah, um, let's go back to this formula here. Yeah. So there was a delta x plus and a delta x minus. Uh -huh. So that's the factor of, two, because delta x plus is equal to delta x minus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Earlier, when we didn't have the flat space piece, there wasn't an independent right mover and a left mover. So then we just had one term and that canceled against the omega piece. Mm. 
And now we have an extra piece coming from like, let's say one of the chiralities. So that's what changes when you supply transparent boundary conditions. So we change the boundary condition for the CFT when we go between the two cases. Yes, here it was, you know, the stuff was just bouncing back into ADS, right? Because there was a boundary. I see. So here, if I drew an excitation, it was just going and then bouncing back. Whereas now, if I couple in the flat space, it can just propagate out and stuff can propagate in. I see. Presumably before you could have used 2x because it was bouncing back, but the distance therefore was double for one mode. Um, it uh, wouldn't the conclusion, but it might have made the explanation clearer. Okay, yes. Before you had one mode going twice the distance, now you have two modes, each going the distance x. Um, right. I think something that was important in the previous cases was that the entanglement of matter was independent of position. Right. Of right. Cancellation. Right. There was a cancellation between uh, this term here and this term here. Mm -hmm. and, and is large C essential here? Uh, so one thing we are ignoring is the fluctuations of the dilaton, for example, in this case, mm -hmm. right? And so it's important for that. Um, but then in the previous case, if we don't take large C, the entanglement wedge is not going to be the whole Poincare patch? Well, there's the different uh, argument for why, you know, just in this simple case, the entanglement wedge should be the entire Poincare patch, which right. is just the purity. Right. Right. So whatever the formula will become, maybe it will be more complicated. We will still have the purity being preserved. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, so where were we? Uh, let's see. Okay, so we have this factor, important factor of two, and we have a log of negative x here, and we extremize and we find this non-trivial extremum. Okay, so let us remember that the dual was really this SYK coupled to the wire, and all entropies start out their definition in this purely quantum mechanical picture. Uh, I want to emphasize this point. Um, so the entropy we were computing was of just this SYK dot, maybe with the little piece of the wire. And we found an entanglement wedge, which is just now a piece of the Poincare patch with this quantum extremal surface at K star. Okay, you might ask, what's the big fuss? Um, this doesn't look uh, that crazy, but if you look at the complement picture, that is, you try to look at now the entanglement wedge of the complement. Well, the spatial slice uh, should be entirely covered by the region and the complement. So therefore, if you looked at a spatial slice, this is you know, the region between B to infinity and between minus infinity to A star is the region in the gravity that's being represented by this complement region, which is a purely non-gravitating region. And now we see that the entanglement wedge of this piece of the wire has a naive piece, the naive entanglement wedge, plus a piece which is very far away from it, deep in the gravity region close to the Poincare horizon. So the upshot is that the entanglement wedge of this region that looked connected in the quantum mechanical picture is actually two disconnected pieces in the gravity description. I'm a little confused about the geometry here. You drew a you know, connected yellow line for space. Yes. P is really infinitely far from every point on the left, right? Well, I, I forgot. I, I, I've started to drop this uh, cutoff surface here. So the pasting is really done at some epsilon. So that's what makes the things finite. The distance. Uh, so you're finite. gluing the you're gluing the quantum dot at, on the green. Yes. With the green. Dot. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay. So so that's the message that the entanglement wedge of the non-gravitating region contains a region that's 
very far from itself and close to the Poincaré horizon. Can, and can, this is maybe another of several yeah. hints that gravity right. theories have non-local effects. Uh, Raghu? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I understood the argument for why the entanglement wedge of the quantum dot, or at least the, the uh, was this smaller yes. uh, square region. Yes. Uh, diamond region. Mm -hmm. um, uh, why is it obvious that the complement of that diamond is the complete entanglement wedge of the... Right. So uh, one argument theory. that I was just alluding to is purity of the state that if we have, but if we have a dual, then we should have uh, this picture. That was my argument right now. But later, when we come to the second scenario of how to compute uh, quantum extremal surfaces easily, in this doubly holographic picture, it will become even more clear that this connected region is a part of the entanglement wedge. Okay, uh, but but yeah. because in principle it could be that that this this diamond region on the left can only be reached through some combination of the the two, at least that it's not, that it's in the entanglement wedge of neither. Uh, meaning. Um, a bit like like indeed if you if you have uh, indeed uh, this uh, if you divide up the boundary of ADS in three regions, there's going to be a region in the book that's not but included. If we have a pure state and we divide up the system into two parts, then we don't have any such problem. Right. Right. So that scenario doesn't really apply here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Okay, and indeed the question that you just asked was the motivation for our first paper in which we introduced this uh, doubly holographic model to make this absolutely clear that this is what is going on. Okay, uh, and this non-local effects uh, become especially clear if you try to, for example, you know, if you had an excitation that lived in this gravity region here, in order to have a CFT representation of it, it would live in, in this piece here. Inside, there would be some complicated excitation in the wire region, which naively is nowhere close to this, this green excitation. Okay, and uh, let's quickly discuss a slight generalization where instead of putting, computing the entanglement wedge of just uh, uh, the, the, the dot, we add a dot and a piece of the wire at x equals b. So earlier we just had b equals an infinitesimal amount. Okay, so now we have a candidate surface A again, and we have a b again. These are their x plus x minus coordinates. The x coordinate of capital A is negative A. And I've taken to put a minus sign here because the x coordinate of A is negative so that A will be a positive quantity just for convenience. So again, we have the dilaton term. We have two contributions, one from the left movers, one from the right movers. And uh, there is this uh, C over six. Now there's a log of A plus B because the coordinate separation is A plus B. And again, we have the familiar wild factor contribution. Uh, we take its derivative we get a phi r over a squared. Uh, this term gives a two over a plus b. The two is from here and there's a minus one over a. And you simplify that, you get this expression. You get this condition for a star. Okay, so this is some quadratic equation that you can solve, but uh, let me just uh, uh, give two limits of this, uh, of this expression. One is the previous limit where b is infinitesimal. So when b is infinitesimal, we can just cancel the numerator and the denominator. And then a star just becomes a phi r times six over c as before. So this recovers the previous case. And the other limit is when b is very large. And when b is very large, what's going to happen is that this numerator is going to be approximately zero. So a star is also going to be large. And then you get a next order correction from the cancellation between this denominator here and two a star here. So that, so a star is b plus phi r times 12 over c. Okay, so, so what does this mean? 
this means that as you keep making b larger and larger, a star also becomes larger and larger. And that makes sense from this picture because if you stop considering the entanglement wedge, uh, sorry, of, of zero to b, where b is all the way here, then it should cover more and more of the gravity region as well because you're covering the entire quantum uh, state. Right. If B was, B was all the way here, then you have pretty much covered most of the system. So this thing should start covering uh, more and more of the ADS side, like going this way. And that's what, what you see from this formula. So that's good. That's again, like a, maybe a sanity check that this, these expressions make sense. Okay. Uh, I just want to make a side remark that uh, the extremization condition, uh, which I reproduced here, implies that A star is bigger than B, right? Because the left-hand side is positive, A star is positive, so A star is bigger than B. And this condition is actually enforced by the quantum focusing conjecture, uh, which is discussed by uh, Rafael Busso, Iron Wall, and collaborators. But I won't go into this today. Uh, anyhow, I just want to draw this picture of what A star bigger than B means. So this green point here is just the reflection of B. And the statement is that A star should lie to the left of that. So again, this is like another, we can take it as a sanity check that uh, things are working. It's consistent with the quantum focusing conjecture. Uh, okay, more questions before we go on to non-zero temperatures. Okay, no questions, then let's go on. So now we want to consider non-zero temperatures and this is what our system is going to be. We are going to have our system of interest, which is an SYK. And now it's in equilibrium with a wire at temperature T. Okay, and uh, this, this left system is just the thermofield partner of the right system. So the SYK has a partner and the wire has a partner. And uh, we can draw now uh, intuitively the geometry that this will produce. So these two SYKs will sort of produce an ADS uh, slice like this, and then there will be time. So we will get a picture that looks like this. So we have uh, these two ADS Rindler patches with the two boundaries, the green lines, and then there's flat space on the two ends. The yellow is the original Poincaré patch. Okay, so we also have the relevant JT solution. The metric is really locally the same because in JT gravity, the metric components don't really have any dynamics. But so these are the usual Poincaré coordinates. And it's uh, uh, nice to make a reparameterization to these Y coordinates, which are just tanch of X. And then the metric becomes one over sinh squared in the Y coordinates. This will, what this means is just that as y plus goes over its complete range in the real line, x plus only covers a finite portion. And that's why uh, this white diamond is only a piece of the Poincare. So, so y goes to infinity here and x goes to infinity here. Okay, what's really different about the T non-zero solution is the dilaton profile. And we had this phi r over epsilon uh, over x term before. This x minus minus x plus is just now a negative 2x. But we pick up this term proportional to the square of the temperature. And we can convert that into this y coordinate that I defined, which was a tanch. And the dilaton is just a 1 over tanch. And again, the difference of these light cone coordinates just means that it depends only on the spatial y coordinate. OK. so. Again, let's consider our system, which is bracketed between these blue things here. Notice it's only a one-sided system for now. It's just a toy problem. And since we just have these bunch of tanches thrown around, the previous condition, essentially there was a one over A star on the left-hand side. That gets replaced by a one over sinh of A star over beta. 
And on the right hand side, we had an A star minus B and an A star plus B. And they just get replaced by cinches of those corresponding quantities. There's some math that you have to do to get here, but uh, uh, I, I didn't want to repeat uh, basically the steps uh, that, that we already did. And I want to note again that this condition again implies A star bigger than B, just because everything is positive and this quantity is A star minus B. Okay, so let's just take the limit of this thing when phi r times the temperature is much bigger than C. Okay, so remember again, phi r had units of length. So this thing is dimensionless. And JT gravity, this is precisely the difference between the entropy of the black hole from the extremal entropy. It goes linearly in the temperature. So this is where we expect to have a thermal black hole. And in this limit, you can replace all the cinches with exponentials. So this, all the three cinches in this equation can be replaced by exponentials. So on this side, we just get exponential of A star, that's here. And on the right-hand side, the exponential of A star cancels and you're left with exponential of B. Okay, so you have some exponential of A star equals exponential of B. You take a log and you get that A star equals B plus uh, the temperature times log of again, the difference between the entropy and the extremal entropy divided by C. And this quantity uh, has a meaning. It was discussed in the papers from May and the scrambling time, this is called the scrambling time is beta times the log of the entropy. And uh, uh, we will go into the meaning of this in a little bit, maybe at the end. Okay, so that's our new quantum extremal surface uh, in the finite temperature uh, case. But now we want to, so far we haven't encountered any entropy paradoxes, and now we want to build up to a situation with some entropy paradox. And uh, for this, let's just consider a different subsystem. So our system is the same, our state is the same, which is a thermophile double of the joint two sides. But now we just consider this left infinite region union this, uh, sorry, the right infinite region union the left infinite region. And we imagine following Hartman, Maldacena, and Mathur to run time forwards on both sides in the black hole geometry. So remember uh, the dual geometry was here. It has some boost symmetry, which moves time in opposite directions on both on the two sides. But if we move time forwards on both sides, then that's a non-trivial time dependent uh, setup. And the entropy uh, has some time dependence. And Hartman and Maldacena argued that precisely in the setup and precisely for a region that looks like this, the entropy grows linearly in time. Okay, so let's just see what's going on. So here is the Cauchy slice set of the boundary system at t equal to zero. And uh, we have the, the B is the point is here. And at time t equal to zero, it's just the naive entanglement wedge. So we are thinking of the entangle, computing the entanglement properties of this region and its entanglement wedge is just uh, some causal development of that region. Okay, and now we move time forward. So this Cauchy slice has now moved upwards. And at small times, this region just moves, uh, you know, the diamond just moves together with it. So this is a picture for T uh, non-zero, but not too large. Okay, so how do we derive the linear growth? Well, in this case, it's particularly simple because, so there's a Y plane here. So this is a Y plane, and this is another Y plane. These are like the two linear patches, and they fit together into, a uh, bigger plane. And this we can call the W plane here. So this, this big plane is the W plane and the state in the W plane is just the vacuum because the state in the Y's was, was the thermal state. Okay, so um, all we really need to do is compute the coordinates, the W coordinates of the endpoints and just apply the entropy formula. Um, Okay, so here's the, the left endpoint, which has a, you know, 
the, 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 the Minkowski coordinates are exponentials of the Rindler coordinates. The Rindler coordinates uh, have a T now in them. And uh, this is W uh, plus, and this is W minus. And the right end point has the same coordinates, but they're swapped. So uh, yeah, because the, the right end point is the reflection of the left end point in the vertical line here. So, so there's a vertical line in this figure like that. And this point and this point are related by a reflection across that line. Okay, so there are some coordinates. And uh, okay, so here's the difference in the coordinates. So it, it goes, the, the important thing to note is that you get this cosh of two pi t over beta. So when you take the log of that, it's a function that's growing linearly in time. Okay, so, so you get an entropy that starts at some value and starts after a few thermal times, starts to grow linearly in time. It's log of an exponential. But uh, here's now the catch and where the situation differs from slightly from hartmann malzasena we know that the entropy of, of, this, of these, the union of these two regions is the same as the entropy of the complement, which is this region, union this region. But that is bounded by two times the black hole entropy or two times N, where N is the number of Majorana fermions of the SYK. So we know that this linear growth cannot continue forever. And what happens is that beyond a certain time, you the, uh, the entanglement wedge of the radiation region contains this disconnected piece with the value of A star being given by what we just computed above. At late times, it's very well approximated by that, by that value. So, so, so here's again the surprising thing. We were computing the entanglement wedge of a union of two regions, which were completely uh, non, in a non-gravitating region. And uh, somehow its entanglement wedge contains a piece in the gravity region, in the ADS2 region. And if you compute the, uh, the generalized entropy on this extremal surface, you find a, a roughly a constant. And so here's the, here's the curve. So you have some initial value. It starts to grow linearly after a few thermal times and then saturates because of this uh, new surface coming in at late time. Okay, so you're prevented from an entropy paradox. So the appearance of this disconnected piece of the entanglement wedge uh, saves us from an entropy paradox. If we didn't have the island, this, this entropy would have continued increasing forever. And it would contradict the fact that the two black holes together have an entropy, uh, you know, the core strain, the total core strain entropy is two times the black hole entropy. Okay, so th such disconnected regions are what we call entanglement islands. Um, okay, so questions. This is a good time to start up for questions. Maybe I lost everyone. Okay. Okay, now I want to briefly discuss uh, higher dimensions. And um, the second scenario, I said there were two scenarios in which S bulk is calculable. And assume that now that the matter CFT D plus one is also holographic. That is, it has an ADS D plus two dual. And then the S bulk uh, also has geometry. So remember S bulk is just an entanglement entropy in a bulk theory. And if the matter in the bulk was itself holographic, this S bulk gets geometrized as an RT surface in ADS D plus two. Uh, this is what we discussed uh, in, the, uh, in the first paper with Ying. Okay, so now I want to go back uh, to the ADS three case and answer Herman's question. Okay, so let's go to this uh, disconnected region here and see what happens. Okay, so, so we are imagining that uh, the matter that propagates here has a third holographic. It's dual to a ADS3. 
And so I want you to imagine, uh, it's hard to do this on uh, digitally, but if you imagine a direction coming out of the screen and the blue region, let's start from the bath side. So we start from this side. Imagine this blue region comes out into the Z direction, uh, sort of curves over to the left and then attaches down here. So that's what you get from, from three-dimensional picture, that the entanglement wedge of the bath region contain it, the thing that looks disconnected from a two-dimensional point of view is really connected in three dimensions. It, so these two diamonds are connected via the third dimension. And that makes it much less mysterious uh, why, um, why this island was there. Can this be discussed? Okay. So again, just to summarize, because this doubly holographic thing can be confusing. So in the paper with Ahmed and George, we considered the case of D equals three. And this system has three descriptions. There's a description, which is a purely quantum mechanical description we should view as fundamental, which is a two plus one D holographic QFT at the boundary of a three plus one D QFT, okay? And there's a second description which you might want to call the real world description in which you have a three plus one D gravity. So now you lose this holographic QFT because you replaced it with its gravity dual and you still have this gravity, you know, this would describe a black hole in our universe, say, coupled to a QFT of four. And there's a third description in which you also replace this QFT4 with the ADS5. So the third description is a gravity three plus one on a brain embedded inside uh, ADS4 plus one. And uh, this is the Randall syndrome scenarios where you discuss gravity on brains embedded in higher dimensions. So George was able to solve for this 5D geometry numerically and then also find minimal surfaces numerically in this numerical geometry. So what's the picture? Uh, I just want to focus on some pictures. So let's just make some drawings. So here we have our two SYKs coupled to wires and we were considering this blue region, the entanglement entropy of these blue regions. And I want to draw now next to it, the setup of Hartman and Maldacena in which there are just two CFT two CFTs. These are the spatial slice of the CFTs is represented by these lines. And they also consider such a region, which is half of the right CFT union, half of the left CFT. And I want to draw this ADS coupled to flat space now in a different way. So remember the ADS coupled to flat space was here. We had some ADS2 region and these two flat space wings, one on the left, one on the right. Okay, and here I have just folded these wings outwards. So there, these are the flat space wings and I have just folded them out of the plane of ADS. It's just to aid visualization. And this green line is a Cauchy slice uh, in, this, in this geometry. Okay, so let's just consider now spatial. So let's forget the time direction, which is vertical in this picture. And you get this. So there's again a green line, there's a right boundary, there's a left boundary, and this H is the gravity region. So this, this here is the gravity region, the 2D gravity region. And since we assume that all matter living on this slice is holographic, when we remove that matter, we can replace it with a dual geometry everywhere here. So in this direction, you solve for GIJ numerically, given some boundary conditions. So there's some Dirichlet boundary conditions on right and left. And what makes the brain different is that you put Neumann boundary conditions on the vertical edge. So there are some uh, five uh, functions that you have to solve for uh, as a function of two variables, which are the variables in this plane. And I have, of course, suppressed uh, 
the time and two spatial dimensions here. And there's, of course, there's a bulk horizon which extends the ADS horizon on the brain. So this is how it extends. And there is some geometry that you fill in. Contrast this again with hartmann maldacena hartmann maldacena also have a right uh, CF, CFT, a left CFT. This is the Z direction of ADS. And in the middle somewhere, there's a horizon. And we are computing the entropy of these uh, blue, the union of the blue regions. Okay, so now you can just guess that there is one extremal surface, right? So the, um, that just connects this blue point to this blue point and goes through the horizon. Okay, this is the surface that uh, dominates at early times. And since uh, this surface is going through the bifurcation surface, as you move time forwards, it enters the region behind the horizon and its area starts to grow linearly, basically because of the linear growth of nice slices. And I want to explain this via the following picture, which is just a picture from hartmann maldacena So what do we have here? We have this plane. So now we have both time and the boundary spatial directions. There's an L plane and an R plane, which is behind. And there's a Z direction that's going between these uh, planes like that. So this plane is what you might normally draw as a Penrose diagram, looking on it from this way. If you look at it this way, this thing looks like a Penrose diagram. These green lines are what we have at t equals zero. These are the Cauchy slices on the boundary at t equals zero. In the bulk, there's a horizon. This red dot is the bifurcation surface which extends, of course, horizontally. I have not drawn it. The red lines are the time dependence of that bifurcation surface. So what are the entropy we are computing? Again, the blue lines are our region whose entropy we are computing at some time t. And what hartmann maldacena showed is that the RT surface looks like this yellow curve. It, it starts from the boundary, goes into the bulk, cuts the horizon, goes in, lies along some radial position at the horizon and comes out this way. And because these slices are going in the horizon and there's a growth of space in the horizon, uh, behind the horizon, the entropy grows linearly. And the same phenomena happens, I just haven't drawn the picture for this setup. The setup where the CFD is not infinite, but we have it cut off by a brain on the left-hand side. Okay, so punchline, we have an initial surface whose entropy is growing linearly in time. And again, by the same logic, this should not continue forever because the entropy of the complement is bounded. So what ends up happening is that the extremal surface at late times just ends on the brain. It just ends on this vertical line, which is the gravitational 4D region. Okay. So now this is the island region. This part here from a purely uh, lower dimensional perspective, which was just uh, you know, this theory along the green lines, you have this blue region, which is the naive piece of the entanglement wedge. And then we nucleated an island, okay? And so the full entanglement wedge in 5D in this case is this shaded region. So we see uh, this yellow that I shaded and the blue look disconnected if you just uh, look at the boundary like this, but they're connected through the bulk, which is what I was trying to explain in the 3D case also. Uh, oh yes, question? Yeah, I do have a question. So um, again, if I just look at the green uh, rope, yeah volume of a world situation, then there's a, a black hole, right? Or not on the boundary? Yes, yes, there is. So there is this, this green dot, which I've called H here, is the black hole horizon on the boundary. Uh, oh, so the island region is extending beyond the horizon on the boundary? Yes, so in these coupled situations, uh, the island lies outside the horizon. I should have probably emphasized that if you see here, 
the point A star is lying outside the horizon. Uh, it so doesn't, the, for the evaporating case, it's different. It lies inside. And then you really need to solve the time dependent geometry uh, to get this right. for the evaporating case. But uh, because of the fact, sorry, yeah, because of the fact that this A star in this coupled eternal situation, Hartle Hawking state, lies outside the horizon, it's visible in a static computation just at the t equal to zero slice. Right. So also from the point of view of the higher dimensional bulk, the extremal surface lies out, outside of the horizon all the time. Uh, yes, except the one that I didn't draw, which would be the analog of this surface at a small but finite time, not time not too large, in which it would look essentially something like this yellow curve here, which goes inside the horizon. This is like the hartmann waldus standard picture. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Okay. So um, we're at the end of time, and um, basically, I'm also done with the talk. So, as I was just uh, answering in response to Herman's questions, in evaporating black holes, which were considered in the papers in May, the A star point lies inside the horizon. And you have the naive region of the radiation, which is this blue region here, but you get a disconnected piece in the interior. So we should think of these two blue regions together as being dual to just uh, this part. So this is the truly quantum mechanical description. Here, we just have a single radiation region and in the gravity description, it contains two disconnected pieces. So, so what's the physics? Why in the evaporating black hole case, especially, it becomes advantageous to add this A star? Because remember, the S gen is area plus S bulk. So there were two surfaces, one in which you have the island and one in which you don't. The in which you don't is just this naive surface. So when you add this, this, this disconnected region, you pay a price at area or the dilaton at that point. But the point is that at late times, because of this buildup of entanglement due to Hawking effect, the entanglement between the region where the island is and the radiation region is large. So there's a lot of entanglement between uh, modes here. So basically, if there's a EPR pair, there's a qubit in an EPR pair, its partner is over here. So if you include both a qubit and its EPR partner, you save on S bulk, you save on this quantity. So there's a trade off. Uh, it becomes worthwhile to include the island region because even though you pay the price of the area, the savings in S bulk are big enough to pay for it. And once you include the island, uh, the actual value of the entropy on that surface is basically equal to the area of the horizon at time t, because you just included all the EPR pairs in your um, entanglement wedge. And we know that for an evaporating black hole, uh, it's shrinking because it's evaporating, so its area is shrinking. And that's why the entropy goes down at late times. It simply tracks the area of an evaporating black hole, and that's how you recover the page curve at late times. I haven't explained at all about the evaporating case and the math. It's more difficult. You have to solve for the back reaction and so on, and finding these quantum extremal surfaces is non-trivial, but that's the physical message. Okay, uh, any questions before I conclude with some uh, speculative comments? Okay, so here's, a, here's some method. So, so the lore would have been that a semi-classical geometry or perhaps even a path integral over space-time manifolds 
cannot allow us to recover the page curve because it seems to be some fine grained information about the von Neumann entropy. Why should geometry have any right to know about it? The lesson from the past year has been that um, certain quantities are special. And for an example is this quantity trace row log row. It's a special quantity that you can compute using a path integral over metrics and using replica wormholes and non-trivial saddles and all these things. But it's just one number out of dim h squared components of rho. So if you imagine you have some density matrix and you want to get every single matrix element, that's a lot more information than just knowing trace of rho log rho. Okay, maybe you can compute the Rennie entropies you will have dim h numbers, but you still won't have dim h squared amount of information. Okay, and my suspicion is we should probably not expect, uh, this, is just a, um, this is just my feeling, uh, uh, it's not particularly strong, is that the path integral over space-time manifolds should not be expected to give us every matrix element of rho. And so why is that? You might say, okay, it's computing the entropy correctly, but it's not computing the individual matrix elements correctly. What's going on? And the lesson seems to be that uh, the space, the path integrals over space-time manifolds are computing some sort of average of the quantity you thought it was computing. Okay, so you, you set up some path integral with some boundary conditions. You thought it was computing some quantity quantity, but it's actually computing some sort of average. And then it's completely consistent to have a rho ij as computed by a gravitational path integral to be a maximally mixed, like looks like just delta ij, rho, if you compute rho ij, but the trace rho log rho, which is the entropy is still zero because this expectation value, it doesn't commute with, um, it's not, yeah trace row log row is not linear. In other words, if you did dim h squared separate path integral calculations to compute all the row ij, you would probably find the answer is delta ij or some small modification thereof. But if you set up the path integral to directly compute trace log row, you somehow find zero, like you find the correct answer for a pure state. Okay. And there is some more explanation of this, which is the fact that the Rennie entropies and the von Neumann entropy are self-averaging quantities, whereas the individual rho ij are probably not. And final comment is that I think that the kind of ingredients beyond the path integral over space times that will be needed to compute rho ij would presumably be similar to the ingredients needed to give uh, the erratic oscillations in ZZ star, the spectral form factor, uh, the wiggles on the ramp and the plateau, which are also not self-averaging, and also the complete black hole S matrix. So the entropy and the uh, Rennie entropies are just piece of the information. We don't know these more detailed quantities yet. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Raghu, for this very nice and clear talk. Um, is there any other questions from the audience? Uh, can you, question, Raghu. Yeah. Can, can you comment on how this island rule applies to cases where you have a closed universe, like a baby universe or something? Are you supposed to, yeah, how does it, can you comment on how to use it in that case? Yeah, so we had a discussion of this um, in our paper. So, um, okay, so let me go back. I probably should not have shut this. Okay, so if if we have some, you know, bunch of quantum mechanical spins here, and mm -hmm. uh, let's say they interacted with something in the past, and 
and you know this is some closed universe. So this is supposed to be a one D closed universe. And uh, okay, let's say this is Alice's part of the EPR pair, and this is Bob's part. And if you're trying to compute, you know, the entropy of just the purely quantum mechanical system of Bob, you should find that it's a pure state because um, the 1D closed universe has no area. So you never pay an area price. Mm -hmm. And if you include A, you, you save on the S bulk directly. Right. I see. So, uh, I don't know what the implications of this are, the fact that you know, the closed universe, the area, it has no boundary, so the area contribution is not there. Yeah, let me not say anything more, except that um, there are certain cases in which you can imagine such things happening. For example, um, Juan has been emphasizing uh, the Penrose diagram after the black hole is completely evaporated. So imagine we have some black hole space time, we threw in some matter, it formed some singularity, there was some horizon, right? And the horizon evaporates completely and the singularity ends at some point. And after that, so this is the behind the black hole region. And for an observer living in the future of when this black hole completely evaporated, does this, uh, does this closed universe now, or I should draw it this way in this picture, the closed universe this way, uh, does it have any implications for the physics that this guy sees? And I think that's an interesting question to think more about. Uh, I don't really have anything more intelligent to say. I see. I see. Hmm. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Um... If there's no more question, let's thank Raghu again. Thank you, Raghu. Okay, thanks.